Okay, um, we're going to get going. Our first speaker today is Alison Lister, just as in the previous session, it seems to be a trend for us, who's going to speak about fairsharing.org and the RDA grant she has about um, building a curation community. Hello again, I see some faces from earlier and some new ones, and I'm sure there'll be a few coming in as we begin. So this time, rather than talking about data policies, I'm talking about a new uh, initiative within Fair Sharing called the Community Curator Program. And this is as part of my work with the RDA and EOSC Future as one of their domain ambassadors. And for me, my domain ambassadorship revolves not around a single subject domain, but around the domain of standards, databases, and data policies. So these resources that really help us enable FAIR. So FAIR sharing is already an element of the EOSC ecosystem. We have uh, onboarded onto the marketplace at that very long URL at the bottom that I do not expect any of you to know. But what is important here is that we have a very broad a uh, group of stakeholders. We have developers of resources, we have users of resources, we have policymakers, journals, we have funders, we have research uh, develop standards development organizations. They all come to us for different reasons. And we have many records, but more importantly, we have many co contributors. So while we have over 3,800 records that describe databases, describe data standards, and describe data policies, we have over 1,000 people who are registered with us to describe those resources themselves. So these are developers of those resources who've come to us to make sure that their record with us is up to date, and therefore to make sure their database standard or data policy is more findable, more accessible. And so another point to make is that fair sharing covers all disciplines. And this is important when I come to the community curation program in just a moment. So we store information on these databases, standards, and data policies that are across all of engineering science, natural sciences, humanities, and social sciences. And what we have here is an example of the way you can browse those subjects. And what we've done is we have a sort of sunburst that describes the entire hierarchy of our subject area and how you can drill down in this case through to the social sciences to find out what resources we have there. We also work to create these groupings, these collections of various uh, community uh, slices of fair sharing. So here we have IVOA in astrophysics and astronomy, and we also have the EOSC Life collection itself, which describes all those resources that are developed within EOSC Life itself. And these graphs are the core of fair sharing. So, Moving on towards our community of curators. Well, they all have organizations that they're a member of, and we want to highlight both our users, our maintainers of these records, and those organizations. So this is an example of GBIF, which is a biodiversity organization, where we link through to the Roar ID, as well as for users, we link through to their ORCIDs, and we show the standards, repositories, and policies that each organization uses and endorses. So this allows them to have a live version of those resources that are all associated with that one organization and a lovely relationship graph of those resources. Now the Fair Sharing Community Curation Program itself. This is where I'll stop and just spend a little bit more time. We started in September with an intake of about 20 new community curators off the back of this RGA EOSC Future Domain Ambassadorship, which has allowed us to really launch across all the EOSC clusters and beyond throughout the RDA working groups. So what do we do with our community curators? Well, we have a lot of records. You saw we had 3,800 or more. And what we really like to do is enrich not just the metadata, but those relationships, because that's that's my favorite part of fair sharing. What can you learn about the ecosystem, about the landscape of resources that are within a particular domain or a consortium? And so what we did is we put a call out saying, are you interested in finding out more about the resources in your domain? Or are you an expert in those resources and would like to make sure they're well represented within fair sharing and by proxy right through to all the tools that use fair sharing like for fair assessment or for DMP creation and also right through to all of the, the, the community that will come to discover the resources they need through us. So. With that, we get a lot of people across all research domains, and what we can give them in return 
is attribution and new expertise. So an example here would be the snippet of an ORCID profile for one of our new fair sharing community curators where we as a trusted organization through the Bodleian Libraries at Oxford can push their volunteer work with us right to their ORCID profile. And we'll do this on an annual basis. So even if they work with us for just one part of the year, they will get this award. We're really trying to engage the network and build up a community that is in, in interested in enriching the landscape of resources within their domain. We also showcase their work. Whenever they edit a record, we give them a credit on that record in addition to the, anyone who's an actual maintainer for it. And so what you really get here is we get curated content. We get extra engagement across the RDA, across EOSC, and we also get to enrich and, 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 and create a network of people who are all interested and engaged in, in increasing the findability, increasing the, the accessibility of the resources that they are interested in and that are really relevant for their community. And as I said, we are cross-discipline and as such, our first intake has actually, and I'm really proud of this, had quite a few within social sciences and humanities. And so we have had before, all of our in-house curation team tend to have come from the natural sciences. So having a nice new intake in social sciences and humanities is going to be really, really good for us. But we have other community curators across lots of different domains. So as a final note, I've talked about relationships and how those are so important to fair sharing, not just the the record relationships that form the basis of our resource, but the human relationships that we're using to improve the quality of fair sharing and improve the, the connections we have among our user community. But we also use uh, and then try to showcase how fair sharing itself is fair. And this is a summary of all the different ways in which we align with fair itself. And just to finish off with a thank you that's far too tiny for you to read everyone, but we just want to say a big thank you to our executive and our stakeholder advisors and our community curators, which you can go and have a look at any time. And also to say, if any of you out there think this calls to you and that you might like to be a part, we're really quite inclusive and really quite friendly. So if you wish to, if you think that maybe you can help your community by enhancing the landscape of resource connectivity and fair sharing, then absolutely get in touch with us. And that's everything. Thank you. I'm going to move us on unless anyone has a burning question. If you do, please stick up your hand and I can come with a mic at the end of the talks. But we have 10 lightning talks and only eight minutes per talk. So um, I'm going to move us on to Barbara Magana, who's going to speak about the Embry Fair Fair Implementation Profile approach. Thank you very much. So I speak about the approach uh, we used in Envy Fair to assess um, the implementation choices uh, used by the different research infrastructures included in uh, this um, project. Envy are environmental research infrastructures um, at the um, S3 uh, level, and they uh, uh, are organized as a community, but in Envy Fair, uh, 14 of them are represented and they are um, um, working in different subdomains, um, marine, uh, atmosphere, ecosystem and solid earth. And um, Envy Fair is now in the last year um, of um, the project. Um, the goal of this um, project is um, the first goals were really to assess uh, the fair level of the research infrastructures and to harmonize their choices. And there are many other um, goals that uh, we, we want um, to achieve here, but I focus now on the first two, where I have been involved and in charge to do the fair assessment. Uh, for um, finding a, a systematic way to um, approach this, we um, started from a questionnaire approach. Uh, as, uh, at the beginning, it was a very long questionnaire. But uh, then, uh, together with GoFair Foundation, we could um, identify a very um, a short list of questions addressing each of the FAIR principles. 
And uh, by identifying the fair neighboring resources, um, which are digital objects that provide some aspects of fairness to, uh, for data uh, and metadata, and the collection of all these fair neighboring resources are the fair implementation profiles. So this is a collection of machine readable human agreements addressing these aspects. For that, we developed a, a fair implementation profile ontology, uh, where um, in the center we have the community, the fair implementation community, declaring the use of fair enabling resources um, specifically for, um, for, spe uh, for, different, uh, for the different principles and sub-principles um, mentioned. Um, and uh, we also identified different types of fair enabling resources. Uh, to be able to identify uh, the resources. Uh, for example, for F1, we have identifier services. For F2, metadata schemas. Or for I2, structured vocabulary and so on. And um, to be able to express this uh, uh, also as fair digital objects, we used uh, nano publications to um, describe, to represent each of these fair enabling resources. And nano publications uh, have three layers on, of information. Uh, the blue part is about stating, um, for example, that the community is using a fair enabling resource, uh, or stating that the fair enabling resource is of a specific type. And uh, we used the FIP wizard, that's a, um, a customized um, uh, instance of the data search wizard uh, to include the, the FIP questionnaire. Uh, in such a way that we get out RDF data um, to, um, yeah, um, to use this as um, the tool to interact with the communities. And we could uh, do this for all the research infrastructures in NVFair. Um, but here you see the over, uh, overall approach. Um, you see that there are, uh, we, need, we need this tool. We have this tool to interact with the users. Uh, behind, we are sp uh, storing all this information as fair data in an RDF uh, triple store. But there is also a qualification step in between. Um, and uh, once we have every, uh, collected everything in the uh, triple store, we can also um, produce a convergence metrics. Uh, to compare all these uh, different implementations across the communities and do a FIP analytics. So I must say that this is a really good uh, success story of uh, collaboration between Enri Fair, GoFair, and Code Events, which is the company in, here in, uh, in Prague uh, supporting this, um, uh, this tooling. Uh, the outputs of FIPS are human readable, but also machine readable, and I think both is needed um, to uh, reach what we want to do. Uh, and uh, the, um, the goal is to converge at the end. Um, and this is um, the FIP uh, or fair convergence matrix, where you see the fair enabling resources uh, uh, in the first column. Uh, and rows, and, and in each uh, separate column, you see uh, the co communities or the research infrastructures. In EnriFair, the communities were organized around the repositories they are using, and you see uh, a column is representing a fair implementation profile. The numbers here, or the colors, are um, just um, uh, using, um, uh, are just um, indicating which uh, principle they belong to, and also how. Is, uh, the usage status is, if, if something is used now or is planned to be used in future. Uh, the darker the color, the more concrete is the, the usage or uh, is used now. Uh, here you see the cycle. We started the, fair, the first fair assessment 2019. We did then a gap analysis out of the gap analysis. So the gap analysis means that not in, for each of the principles, uh, the research infrastructures have implemented yet something. So. Uh, this leads to a fair implementation plan with the idea, okay, there needs to be some work, some uh, metadata schemas or, or vocabularies have to be uh, implemented or found uh, or, or agreed on. And then we did the second fair assessment on, um, um, in 2020 and 21, and we will have a last one next, early next year. And this helps to, uh, at the end, converge because uh, with this uh, 
approach, we can see uh, w what resources we have and how we can converge between the different uh, infrastructures. You see here that we have now 57 FIPS uh, for NVFair. Um, convergence can happen by um, overlapping, so just using the same resources, but a convergence can also happen differently because it depends on the resource quality and how interoperable these resources are. This second aspect is not yet covered in FIPS. Uh, here you see the resource overlap. And so the benefits is that, people, the, that the people involved in this process really understood how they, um, sh what they should care for if they want to achieve more fairness. They can learn from other uh, research infrastructures, uh, compare and see how they can converge. Uh, in brief, briefly. There are also limits. The limit is that it's sometimes difficult uh, to find the right accuracy level for defining a fair neighboring resource, also to define the community, um, because they are very often centered around repositories. The convergence might result not only by overlap, but also by interoperability quality. Um, and um, yeah. We have seen that this approach has been not only uh, used by Henry Fair, but now also by many other communities. Uh, World Fair, for example, is using it, and that's a much larger project than Henry Fair. And this brings us also to the necessity to improve the fair implementation profile uh, approach. We have also here to increase. It's already fair somehow, yeah? It's, but it's not the last status. We have to increase friendability. We think a search engine, which is user-friendly and not only a Sparkle endpoint, <laughs> needs to be provided, increase interoperability. So uh, try to also um, include mapped resources, increase reusability, so FIP to DMP. So, okay, mapped resources, I just want to say that that's the link to fair sharing. We are working uh, with Alison Lister and that we link uh, what we produced as Nando publications to the resources represented in fair sharing. We want to also reuse this. For example, DMPs are having mostly the same fair neighboring resources also included, so we are working on this tooling, but it needs uh, to be mapped. Um, Anybody interested in this work, I'm happy to collaborate because it's a lot of work. Um, and we want to increase machine actionability. And this includes automated fair enabling resource qualification, fair score for fair enabling resources, not for the profile, for the fair enabling resources, and machine actionability, uh, machine actionable metadata for fair digital objects. Because this would be a nice uh, extra metadata la layer for machine actionability for the fair digital objects. If a fair digital object has this information, it might be understood by machines better. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please. Go ahead. One from Ellie here. Yes, thank you very much. Although I arrived late, I think the FIP caught my attention, the fair implementation um, profile. And putting this into the context of data management planning and having in mind the domain data protocols that uh, were the guidelines of the Science Europe for domain-specific um, DMPs, I'm interested to understand the, the connection uh, of these two different um, concepts. You mean uh, um, data management plans and fair implementation profiles or? Policy? Fair implementation profiles and domain data protocols, which are be essentially uh, discipline specific templates for data management plans. I think I have to investigate this a bit more to be able to answer this uh, and learn more about this. Um, um. The domain data protocol, okay, okay. Yeah, so I cannot really answer that yet but I'm happy to, to look at it. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think from what I know of DDPs, they could probably help you with the FIP because it's looking at the practice in certain disciplines and what's good practice and what would make something fair. So there's yeah. probably an alignment. It's useful to look at them together. Yeah. Excellent, thank you very thank you. much, Barbara. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to invite up the next speaker, Carsten Hoyer-Click, who's gonna speak about moving the domain of energy systems analysis towards fair data.
Okay, um, thank you for inviting me to speak here. Uh, my name is Carsten Neuklick from the German Aerospace Center. Um, there's many other people involved here there on the, on the front slide, and I want to talk how we do move our um, domain into um, towards fair data. Um, the background is the open energy family, so the focus of our research is future energy systems. How do we move into sustainable energy systems by 2050? And this is an initiative which started around 2015, so something before FAIR was talked about and before the EOSC was talked about. And uh, we're now developing this, this into a fair in data infrastructure. And I think we're one of the examples of these communities which evolved over time, which um, should and should move into the EOSC and how to, to make our things more compatible. Um, so what do we do to make it findable? We have the OE metadata standard. It's a standard for energy-related data. And it's based on existing technologies like frictionless data and data site. Um, it's implemented as a JSON LD, so we heard a lot of this before, to be human and machine readable. Um, the latest release, 1.51, is ontology ready, so we have it linked to, to an, an ontology. We'll talk about this later. And the target really is uh, to have this data as five star um, linked open data available. So, what does it uh, metadata comprise? So, it com comprises the usual things, so the, the context, special, temporal, source information, provenance information. What's a little bit more about special here is it contains a resource section where you really can describe your data source in more detail. You can put in schemas there and describe the individual columns of the data set so that you really are able to dive into the content of the data set. And we have also included um, a review section where we can uh, enter um, reviews of the data set and, and assessments of the data set so that people have a better idea what's the quality and what's the use of the data. And we, we can do something like a peer review on the data sources. Um, then for to make it findable and accessible, we use the uh, DBpedia data bus as a catalog. Uh, so it's a virtual bus. I don't know, I have to talk too much about it. We had a lot of these things before. Um, it's based on data ID metadata. Um, and it actually is only a catalog. It doesn't contain any data. We have these decentralized resources. We push our metadata as uh, RDF or JSON-LD to, to the catalog. And then you can start searching and querying. Um, and you get the download links for the in individual data sets which are reg registered on the data bus. Or it could be that you have data bus collections. So if there is many data sets which are grouped together which have some kind of connections, you can directly also say these data sets are connected and, and belong to each other for a common research project or a common assessment. And then you find the data from the different data repositories and you can download and start working with it. It offers persistent ID, um, uh, persistent identifiers. Um, <coughs> and there you can link the different sources uh, through their IDs so that you can see their, which data sets originated from which data source or how they were incrementally changed. Uh, the, whole arc, the whole concept is here, if you go from left to right, you have the data source on the left-hand side, you have the data bus on the top, where you have the metadata, then you can start taking the data, do a service on it, some modeling on it. This is very typical for our domain. We set up a lot of modeling chains, so we have one model doing one thing, then the output is used by a different model, and then it's used in, again by another model, so we have this whole modeling change, and you really can trace all the workflows um, which you have done on the data and trace it back. So the idea is if you see a publication with an interesting plot, I say, oh, this is very interesting also my research work. And the idea is really to be able to trace back where it originates from and that you can really find the source data which went in the original modeling. <clears throat> and to make it interoperable, we have the open energy ontology. Um, of course, we know that each data source comes on annotation, and we've created the Open Energy Ontology as a kind of standard data language to describe the data here. Um, <clears throat> and we decided to have an ontology instead of a taxonomy to make it, um, to do all the, these features of, of the ontology. Um, it's a large community process to develop this ontology, so we worked there for several years already with lots of developer meetings and discussions and anything, so it's a kind of grass-rooted uh, domain ontology. If you want to read more, you can look at the platform, or there is a paper in Energy and AI where we describe all the ontology development process. 
And then you can use the ontology to annotate your data. So there's a subject tag in the JSON-LD which you can kind of use the ontology to get information what is in the data set. But you can also use the is about field in the schema description to individually mark what's in the individual columns so that you really can dig down what's in the individual data sets that you can also interpret the data and reuse the data. So the conclusion is um, we have an architecture with the data bus, which is a service to manage and search registered metadata. We have persistent identifiers uh, for data processing and data citing. Um, it, they can be used as pointers to digital objects. Uh, the data is reusable. I make this short, but we have data licenses and op um, as a, you need to put the, the data uh, part in there and it's linked to Dalek to um, make the, these licenses machine actionable. Um, so we kind of more or less implemented the FAIR principles for the whole domain uh, and make it FAIR. Um, <clears throat> what also is an interesting feature here is with the architecture and with the uh, open energy ontology, you can really do semantic searches within the uh, data which is in there. <clears throat> and in the end, if you look at the architecture with the distributed repositories, common metadata, or schema descriptions, and ontology, a data catalog, so we have our old and small open science cloud there, uh, which we can use for our data. So it's not that operational yet. We, it's just on the finish line right now, but this is something where we do in our domain. If you want to read more, there's a number of resources and information um, on the data sets. That's it. Thank you very much. Any quick questions for Karsten? Yeah, Ingrid? Thank you very much for your presentation. Just a question out of curiosity. Is there any relationship between this project and the ERA data project, which is also in the energy research realm, which works on exactly the same things? Uh, we did have some connections with the uh, ERA data project. So we, okay. there is a, a paper uh, with them published on metadata. I'm a co-author of this paper. So, right. so we, we, have, yeah. we did have some connections in there. Well, that is good to hear because I think that we work in many different places on the same things yep. and sometimes we are reinventing wheels. So it's nice to hear that you uh, are aware of each other. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Karsten. Okay, so I'll move us on. Our next talk is going to be from Chris Schubert on data quality. My name is Chris Schubert uh, and I'm representing here a little bit this work on uh, um, of the uh, EOS task force on, on data quality or it's a, it's a subgroup on data quality here and uh, I want to have a look and, and uh, uh, share the perspective uh, on this um, multidisciplinary approach we, we did and we're working on. So in the end data set quality um, um, you doesn't want to, to um, uh, reinvent or, or provide any new concept on data quality, but we want to have um, 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 or establish more um, uh, kind of constraints how to um, 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 enable um, a quality aspects for, for data sets here. So, and um, yeah, listed um, uh, a number of um, um, yeah, um, aspects and, and indicators uh, how to um, 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 how to apply uh, the, the quality of, of, of data sets here, um, and and of course the, the question is why do we need the uh, uh, or quality information and. Um, the important thing is we, we uh, have uh, to be ready for decision making. We also um, um, need this um, um, to, to um, um, uh, create a com compliance report. And um, we want to ha uh, have also the uh, support of, of um, uh, data and, and uh, uh, information sharing. Uh, 
system and, and the usability really to maximize the sharing of data setting and quality information. So what we did so far, um, we, we started really to um, elaborate a, a common understanding uh, about um, different aspects on, on, uh, on quality approaches, uh, what quality means, uh, how the quality is um, in, ingested or is a part of, of the um, uh, data life cycle, what are the actors uh, which are involved and then the benefit of, of, of the quality. And um, we did a lot of, yeah, we, we call it desk research here, so uh, we analyzed um, uh, the landscape of or of existing standards, um, the literature, and um, discussed also about the uh, common semantic, and then we did a lot of crosswalk uh, between the different uh, initiatives. So, and we also invited and, and integrated the um, lessons learned from, from uh, yeah, from existing initiatives here. So. One aspect is also uh, to um, integrate commu the community. We created a survey. And, um, yeah, uh, asking or ask about um, uh, different aspects regarding quality, uh, quality issues here. We said also, um, or yeah, initiated a RDA session last summer um, with different um, institutions or, or uh, initiatives regarding quality here. And uh, an output will be accepted uh, by the end of the year. Um, yeah, as, as um, uh, recommended, as, uh, yeah, we, uh, as reported in front for, for recommendation. Yeah. Just a, um, um, a little uh, sketch here um, on, the, on the right side uh, for, uh, of, of the inputs. And finally, I have here also a list uh, of the use, take, uh, use cases we, we created here within the task force. So we have a use case um, how to deal with, cli uh, with co uh, quality aspects uh, regarding climate services, climate model and climate research. Um, also the uh, domain of digital collection and humanities, genomic data, spatial data, um, um, it's, it's uh, one uh, aspect here. Um, text mining, subject inde uh, indexing, um, linguistic research, and, and also uh, the field of uh, language models we integrate here uh, as a use case. Yeah, bi biodiversity, social media research, uh, and also the energy research. Um, we created this, um, a lot of use cases here, and um, work on it and, and also test the implementation uh, as a next step um, within this uh, task force on data quality here. Yeah. It was quite quite fast presentation from my side, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, under time, which leaves time for questions. Anyone have a question for Chris? Yeah? Just a quick question. Um, do you consider anything like fitness of use or fitness for use in the data quality assessment? Yes, yeah, of course. So, uh, and we have, to, um, um, we have to find the right balance. Yeah? So if uh, for pra pragmatical approaches, um, um, how we apply or how we deal with data quality and, and also the yeah, standardization and, and, me, uh, and meet the standards uh, they exist. Yeah. This is one part of, of our elaboration and, and I, I guess we will uh, focus also on this uh, for the next month. Okay, so next up I'd like to invite Irina Aphrodite Bello, who's going to speak to us about um, implementing the RDA um, indicators in systems biomedicine. Here we go. That's should be. Did I press the wrong button? Yeah, that's on full screen. 
Hello, I'm Irina Balaur, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Luxembourg Center for Systems Biomedicine, University of Luxembourg. And today I will briefly introduce the fostering to uptake of RDA indicators in systems biomedicine as a measure for model quality and fairness within the combined community project, which is recently funded by the EOSC uh, Future uh, Call, and it's co coordinated with Professor Dagmar Walkmach from Medical Informatics Laboratory, uh, University of Medicine, Graceland, uh, Germany. So just a brief information or introduction. I'm, I'm from LCSB University of Luxembourg and Dagmar is from Medical Informatics Laboratory. Both these groups and the institutes are multi-interdisciplinary -inter groups and have been involved in various translation medicine research projects. With respect to the project from today, uh, several common interests among our groups uh, lie on verification and research data management. And for example, we have been involved in the IMI Fair Plus project. We also have interest in health uh, system standards, uh, systems biology standards, uh, reproducible research, and I will initially, immediately uh, introduce the combined community. So I was saying about systems biomedicine, and just a brief introduction that systems biomedicine actually is a scientific area uh, that studies how biological functions emerge from interactions between components of a living system. So we all know, for example, about proteins and metabolites, but in order to explore a disease mechanism or to predict a disease initiation, for example, we need to know how these components, so uh, molecular uh, components, interact with also patient uh, characteristics. So for example, aging, gender, lifestyle um, features, and so on. And computation modeling have been um, proven have been shown as a very powerful tool to be used in disease initiation, in prognosis of disease initiation, disease development, and also in um, treatment response strategies, for example. And there are a couple of examples there, but I'm not going to details uh, for the talk. And a very successful uh, story on using computation modeling in systems biomedicine is the community project, interdisciplinary project, which is entitled COVID-19 Disease Map. And here, only to give a brief uh, information, it was involving more than 200 researchers from more than 30 institutes and so on. Of course, in order to have this collaboration, they had to follow some standards, and they follow fair principles also very much. I was mentioning about the combined community and stands for computation modeling in biology network. It actually it is the community which develops specification guidelines documentation on the use of systems biology standards towards computation modeling. So what we need to follow in order to develop a computation model that can be used by the community. And we have SBML standard, for example, for, um, for specification of a model itself, uh, systems biology graphical notation for um, standard for um, graphical representation of a disease mechanism or of a biological mechanism, where I'm also an editor, and our standards as well. Dagmar is one of the coordinator of a combined uh, community. So what, what we observe is actually that uh, computation models have been used for a while and they have been proven as um, tools to benefit uh, of uh, systems biomedicine. However, in order to be used in clinic settings, their results had to be, their results have to be reproducible. So the main challenges to increase the impact of computation models have been reviewed uh, in our paper from Niarakis uh, this year. And they also provided, so offers from there, they also provided um, strategies to improve the impact. And if we look to all these uh, strategies, they lie under the umbrella of fair uh, principles. So in other words, in order to be able to reproduce some results, we need to find the model to, to, to know if we can access it, if we can access it, how we can access it, and so on. And not only the model, but also the parameters and the input data and all the data that a model um, um, is, is together with. So what 
What is the aim of a project from today, which started in the beginning of October, so a couple of weeks ago, was to implement a fair evaluation using the um, uh, RDA indicators template developed in the IMI uh, Fair Plus project and to provide a standard procedure for the curators and for the developers during model curation and development. And our motto is to work with a community for the community. So we work together with combined core partners uh, and we aim to provide this fair model indicators for the systems of biomedicine uh, community. And as I was saying, um, we work with a community. We had a first uh, workshop on fairness assessment of combined archive at the Combine 2022 meeting in Berlin beginning of October. And we also aim to help the developers and the, and the uh, curators by implementing a semi-automatic fair evaluation tool for the use of a community. So basically, so the, the developers and the modelers and the curators will be able to fulfill um, some, some fair principles uh, already when they use this tool. If you are interested in our project, and I hope you are, uh, we have also the project websites, our details, and we would like to acknowledge financial support from the EOSC Future uh, uh, grant, and also we would like to thank our collaborators from Combine, from IMI Fair Plus project, and thank you for attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Any questions for Irina? Yes. One component that you didn't talk about when you talk about reproducibility is that modeling and simulation software has to run on an architecture, computer architecture, that may change over, over time. How are you dealing with this situation? Yes, so in, in the sense that's why it's, we have the interoperability. So we we look to the combined uh, archive, combined uh, models, but they already have a structure inside, and the model description is given in the SBML standard format. And then there are other standards like, um, I'll just mention here, uh, SDML, where we can, um, where the developer can mention the specification of a model itself. What I'm saying is the model should be, um, should not depend on the architecture. It should run on any of the, of a, of a platform. Either I use a Mac or another, or a Linux or a Windows or something like this. But this is what I'm saying about interoperability. Yes, but combined archives, they have a specific format inside. So this is what I'm saying. And there is the case, but at least we know about it. Once we assess, we do the fairness assessment, we will know, okay, perhaps there is something that we need to pay attention of. It will be um, described in the metadata of the model. It will be, it depend, depends on the, this is what we are saying. In order to reproduce the model, we need to have details of the model. Sorry, to reproduce the results. Yes. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, next up I'd like to invite Romain David to the floor, who's going to speak about the VIBE initiative and how it follows the FAIR principles. Hello everybody, so I'm Roman David. I work in ERINA, that is a European Research Infrastructure on Highly Pathogenic Agents. Uh, the project that I will present today is not linked to ERINA directly, but uh, uh, it's linked to my involvement in AirScribe project because we are developing several tools and several recommendations and uh, my involvement in uh, RDA, Research Data Alliance uh, Working Group and Interest Group so I've, I have reused a uh, part of these recommendation and tools and the uh, lesson learned to try to implement FAIR in a new community. So the new community is a white project. What is a white project? It what is a new network of on the database that would like to be an international database on water and interdisciplinary biology and eco ecology. So uh, their goal is to 
put together data that come from other information systems and to uh, have survey on data quality in ports in a network of ports in Europe, uh, taking in account biomarkers and uh, uh, bio indicators in uh, organisms, but also uh, chemical uh, 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 markers that are in the environment and other data that are related to the state of the environment and all the events that can happen in each place. So it's a kind of uh, uh, large survey uh, initiative that could take place in the uh, DCSMM, that is the framework uh, of, uh, of uh, marine strategy. And uh, in this case, they were not aware about what are the fair principles. So. Uh, I've tried to, to organize my presentation with three keywords, three questions, and three lessons that we have mainly learned, but there are lots of others. So the first thing was to, uh, for supporting the fairization, to try to uh, uh, say to them why uh, and what are fair and open science and why it is really important for you and what you are able to take with a fair uh, implementation. So the first thing, the better argument is this one. If you have that in, in your kitchen, I think that you will have lots of problems with your uh, identities and, and people that come in your house. So three keywords. The first one was literacy. How to explain what is fair? Uh, it needs something uh, like an iterative approach. And we have lots of things to to, to mix, and uh, the first thing was to describe what they are able to know, and not uh, trying to describe what is a fair vocabulary, for instance. So we have described in a paper, in the framework of, uh, of EOSC Fair, uh, of EOSC Life, sorry, uh, all the steps, and we tried in this project to apply what we have described in theoretically uh, in this paper. And, uh, uh, the work was done with completely neo neophyte person, but dealing with lots of several objects, with several formats, uh, and uh, uh, the final goal, it's not a step now, is to link with metadata in an interdisciplinary way all this data to uh, uh, have meta-analysis approach. So, the case stones. Literacy was uh, mainly supported by training and support, and iterative training and support. Without that, it's impossible to uh, uh, come together with, uh, on this goal. The second one, metadata, uh, is a kind of vo vocabulary stewardship, because at the beginning we tried to just explain, okay, you know where could be the, the good ontology, the good term, the good terminology that you have to use, but if they are not uh, if, if they don't have an ontologist or somebody that is well sensibilized to what is uh, uh, an ontology and how to use it, they are to totally used. So uh, human uh, support is really, really important on this uh, metadata aspect. Uh, we have used uh, three kind of, uh, of tools that we have described in several communications. The first one is data dictionaries how to build a data dictionary, how to describe uh, what is uh, uh, a variable, for instance, and uh, uh, to do that in a way that is understandable in other communities. The second one was data papers and data sprint, because the requirement of all uh, uh, editors uh, help us to find uh, what are the, the better strategy and to go further and, and quickly, we do that on, on the form of, of uh, data and paper sprints. So only meetings with one simple goal to go to another step. And uh, the difficulties that we had it to, it was to deal with multidimensional topics, skills, formats, but also willingness <laughs> and uh, uh, at least also scientific approaches. So for that, we need iterative and step-by-step -step approach and community approve for each step 
approach. The lessons that we have learned, uh, okay, so some fair principles are really easy to implement. It's by design. You choose a kind of uh, identifier that is uh, working or uh, a kind of uh, license that is compliant with uh, all the, 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 pro the, the production. That's okay. But some others are extremely tricky to, to implement. For instance, what is a rich metadata? the famous F2 uh, Wilkinson principle. So it's to have sufficient uh, metadata, but also appropriate. It cho you choose color, what do you put in the color field? And it changes between disciplinaries. So that's an issue, and it could be very big discussions between, between specialists, and I was only spectator. <laughs> Indexation, okay, we speak about uh, uh, we talk about uh, uh, indexation, uh, uh, fair principles, but never about indexation. Indexation is the F4 principle. How to do that? I think that it's not often uh, explained. Uh, for accessible, yes, we have SQL and HTML, but going to Sparkle is not possible for people that don't know what it is and that are not IT people. What is a fair vocabulary? I said that. Uh, the question is, does it really exist today? Or in this field, yes, it exists, I know. <laughs> but for uh, one disciplinary, it's always a, a really uh, hard challenge to find the really fair vocabularies. Often, we found lots of resources in PDF. I don't think it's fair. And the provenance and reproductibility challenge, but I will not explain that, you know that. So, um, the third lesson was the sustainability uh, in interdisciplinary, inter-project context. The challenge was to maintenance, the, how, how to man, maintain IDs, locations, vocabularies, uh, data uh, for creation and, and enrichment, so means that are behind, and provenance components. And uh, we have this conclusion, we must ex explain what is possible, but not at the first step what is desirable because people will run and we, you will never see you then again. So that's the end. Thank you for your attention. I'm pleased to say that today we are sure to not be fair. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks very much, Rangamin. Any quick questions? Yeah, one here. Uh, yeah, thank you for an interesting presentation. Uh, I just wanted to measure that uh, in Australia there's an initiative very much around fair vocabularies and uh, there is an article, 10 Simple Rules for Fair uh, Vocabularies by Simon Cox and, and others. And they have lots of workshops and things going on around this. So maybe you would be interested to get in touch with those initiatives. Yeah, thank you. Which pleasure. Reference. Thank you very much. You. Um, I'd like to now invite up Giuseppe LaRocca from EGI, who will talk about reproducible open science um, with their notebook service. And Drop. Okay, let's start the timer. So, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm a community support team leader at Foundation, Foundation, sorry, and I will present how researchers can use the J notebooks and uh, binder services to facilitate the sharing and the reproducibility of open science. So uh, for those of you who are not aware, um, uh, EJAs is a flagship project for, uh, for EGI. is a project started uh, the 1st of January 2021, 13 months of project. 12 million are the total budget, 8 million is the easy funding budget allocated for, from the commission. Um, the project, uh, the scope of the project is on service delivery. So we are uh, delivering services, uh, production services for EOSC and contribute to the EOSC exchange. Our main target uh, stakeholder are researcher, of course. So we are trying to promote solution which can uh, simplify the, uh, the activity of the, the community. Um, we are in contact with uh, um, 
community with international footprints, uh, H 2020 project, research infrastructure, etc. So the solution that I want to, uh, I'm going to present today to um, help the community to move on the uh, reproducibility spectrum is uh, the notebooks. This is a solution based on Jupyter Hubs. I don't know if you are already familiar with it because this is quite uh, common. Uh, we are not going to reinvent the wheel. In fact, the solution is built on top of this technology, but uh, over the year we collected the additional feature requirement based on the feedback collected from our user community. So we now provide access via authentication authorization service of EGI because we want to give the possibility for the user to use their local accounts, uh, national accounts. We provide a persistent storage. By default, everybody has a uh, folder where they can deposit file and this data will persist even if the, the notebook will be removed. And we, over the year, we try to add additional functionality. Some of them will be presented today. Uh, the good news for you if, uh, is that if you are interested, this service is already in OSCO portal. And you can really start to request access and this is so completely open. So we, are, uh, we, we can offer it for supporting your uh, activity. So this is how the typical notebooks looks like. So it's just a web interface where you can uh, combine together test if you want to comment your research activities, code based on different kernels, and what is important, the data. So you can have a different, uh, you can analyze your data. This data can be uh, imported uh, locally on uh, your um, uh, workspace or either can be collected from other third-party services. So what you have done recently is to make sure that uh, uh, data stored on a different uh, re data repository can be transparent, uh, um, um, harvested and made them available in the uh, user workspace. So this is done via the now the uh, DICE services, B2Drop. So if you have data on B2Drops, you can automatically see on the uh, notebook. Um, environments, and the same with the uh, data hub, which is another services um, uh, that allow you to, to have a transparent access to the data set. In our past experience, when we worked with the um, AG, AG Infra project, uh, we also collaborated with this uh, uh, VRE, uh, D4 Science, uh, so we were also able to, uh, to offer this additional functionality to the community. Uh, this is the um, uh, recipe that we are proposing in order to let people to share and reproduce science. So the starting point, I don't know if the pointer is working, okay. So the starting point is a user that uh, uh, basically access the notebook services. From the notebook services, you prepare your research activities, your data analytics uh, uh, um, workflow. You download this notebook when everything is done. You think that uh, you have uh, all embedded in your notebooks and now you want to share this with your community. So you download and make this available on GitHub. So you create a GitHub repository, you upload your notebooks and uh, with the functionality offered by GitHub, you can link with Zenodo. This gives you the possibility to generate a DOI. So you have a DOI for your notebooks this DOI can be included in any scientific publication that you want to produce to promote your outstanding result. And when everybody, other community or people working with you discover this publication, see the DOI with the EGI binder services, you can replicate this, the research activities. The data set that is used is the same because we are providing the same transparent access either using the EGI notebooks or the EGI bundle services. So this is the solution proposed by EGI for addressing the FAIR principle and uh, help the community to run and share um, research activities. So, uh, okay, this is just a summary, uh, different way to present what I shown before. So we have a notebook services uh, to facilitate the sharing of the data. Data can be hosted on uh, different data repository and this can be harvested using data hubs or P2Drops. You can link everything on, uh, um, on GitHub and in order to make this uh, shareable and reproducible with Binder. This is just an example. Okay, this is a, a link on, G on Zenodo with the DOI uh, with the notebooks that was uh, um, produced by a community. So you access the Binder service 
provide the link of the, your DOI, and uh, this will spawn a, a Kubernetes cluster. There is a Kubernetes cluster uh, behind the scenes that where the notebook will be deployed, and when everything is ready, you can uh, start to use it. Uh, as I mentioned before, the service is open, is uh, already available in uh, EOSC portal. We offer this in two different uh, um, delivery modes. Uh, one is a uh, catch-all instance, so we have a pre set uh, of capacity allocated and this is of completely open to anyone. And for community interested to have a dedicated setup, we can have a, a discussion, we can uh, collect additional requirements, we can have a dedicated um, configuration based on a different uh, resources, a different uh, hardware if needed, etc. And uh, you have a both possibility to request this kind of services for community and for research using the uh, EOSCO portal. So in the end, if you are interested to reproduce science, uh, now you can. So we can move through the um, reproducibility spectrum. So with notebooks and binder, you have this possibility. And if you want to get access, you see here the link. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thanks, Giuseppe. Any questions? One over here. Thank you. I have two questions, so I'll try to be short. Uh, the first one, you mentioned the fact you have to download to then make a repo. Do you plan to automatize that for the researchers that not always think about sharing it in the repository, um, even on other forges? And the second one is, is the connection applicable to other Nextcloud instances than B2Drop? In principle, okay, for the, about the first question, this is the first time that we receive this kind of uh, requirement. We can think about this, if uh, this is possible to automate the uh, registration in GitHub, in uh, GitHub, I think it's possible. Uh, about the integration with other data, uh, third, uh, data service provider, in principle, yes. So uh, if you are interested in, I don't know, if you are a member of a community using a different technology, um, we can start to work together, if you think this is uh, useful. Because what has been done so far, again, is the result of a, a different meeting, a different uh, um, requirement collected from different customers. So, this, because we want to have, in the end, a solution which is used by the community. So this is why our, the comment and the feedback from our customers are important to us, for us to, to evolve the, the, the solution offered by EGI. So it's possible. Okay, next up we have Susanna Sansone, who's going to speak to us about the Fair Cookbook. Thank you, Sandra. Fantastic. So, Irina very nicely introduced already the concept, uh, Irina Bowler, of the concept of the Fair Plus project. And uh, Fair Plus is uh, part of the Innovative Medicine Initiative, now called Innovative Health Initiative, which it's European Commission and pharmaceutical company together. So Fair Plus produced not only the, the, the maturity model that Irina mentioned, I will only quickly mention here, but also one out of which, which is called the Fair Cookbook. Now, this is true, this is a resource for the life sciences, but do not switch off if you are not working in the life sciences, because the infrastructure is very lightweight, it's open source, and we already have interest from people saying, can we do the same thing for another, another area, for another discipline, so you can. Just briefly, the background of this infrastructure which I'm going to present and the content that the infrastructure has, it's lightweight, it's a Jupyter Notebook and GitHub, so nothing complicated the value it's in the content and the expertise that we put together. So what is the cookbook? It's an online resource, it's live and open. Open means everybody can use it and contribute. It's live because as the recipe are created, then they are re reviewed and released. So practically the recipe really cover all the operational aspect of making data fair, fair by design, progressively, you know, from the beginning at, at the first mile, like some people say. So, who the cookbook is 
is for. It's for fair doers. Yes, you need a little bit of expertise to be able to enact the recipe and make data fair. We know that. But also works as a training material for people that need their introduction to how I do fair. And is there an example that walk me through all the steps I need to do to make my data fair? It's also a venue where we bring together the expertise and we recognize the expertise. So let me tell you also how we, we give the recognition to people that create the expertise. And I will mention uh, a little bit later. So first of all, also let me tell you who has developed it. Uh, because FairPlus, like I say, was part of the IMI Now IHI program. We have both academics from the life sciences and pharmaceutical company. And most of the academics are part of the Elixir um, infrastructure. Some are not. And this is very important for us to also anchor thinking to Elixir because in terms of sustainability, now that the FairPlus project is coming to an end, we have embedded the Fair Cookbook into many Elixir nodes, which means it's also part of the new Elixir 2428 program, which means these resources, finger crossed, is not going to disappear, rather it's going to grow. Okay, in terms of coverage, we have now a number around 70 recipes. This sounds a little, but it's a lot, because you will see a little bit the anatomy of recipe, what it takes to write it. Because it's in the life sciences, it's anchored to example. We cover example that are molecular data, clinical data, and preclinical data. And you will see here the, the learning objective that we try to meet into helping people to do data fair, but also to improve the culture or making data fair within the company. As as well as allied what skills are required and as well as what challenges there are. This is just a, a screenshot of the widget because as the content grow, you need to be able to search what the content is and find the right set of recipe that help you making data fair. But also on this part here, you will see that in the, the widget has the maturity level. Now, we are not intended to make to measure your maturity level of your data, but these help, help you to choose the right recipe and how many you need to use to improve your, let's say, uh, discoverability level. Level, okay, so it guides you into selecting more than one recipe to improve the fairness of your data. When it comes to having a quick insight of how a recipe look like, there are both a graphical component, there are sometimes executable code, that's why it's based on Jupyter Notebook, and sometimes there are textual information only, there are obviously um, con um, ingredients and content, but we also have links to other resources within the EOSC sphere, especially in the life science and Elixir, because for example, when we talk about standard, we link to uh, fair sharing. When we talk about uh, uh, high level guidance on research data management, we, we link to the RDM kit and, and so on and so forth, the state data surety wizard and, and, and others. This is about the credits, uh, giving credit to the people that write the recipe as well as making the recipe discoverable. I mentioned that it's open to contribution when I credit the expertise. So each recipe is uniquely identified because obviously the same fair cookbook is fair as an online resource. So an example is each recipe has an DOI and each author is identifying through their orchids and their type of contribution because they can be writer, they can be reviewer, it's tagged through the credit ontology. So this is really my last slide. I was a bit faster, but that's OK. Uh, if you want to know more about how effective the resource has been, how has been building it, but also testing their validity, you have a preprint here. The link, by the way, it's in the abstract in the web page where all the, 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 the talk are listed. We explain also how we have uh, um, tested and valued the effectiveness of those recipes with the FairPlus Fellow, as well as inside the company. And now we have managed to improve the culture of fair data. And by the way, besides being anchored to, uh, to Elixir, it's not just limited to Elixir. For example, in the editorial board, that somehow super, uh, uh, um, um, uh, co coordinated the content and the evolution of the cookbook, we also have a, a, the a representative from the NIH Data Strategy Office. And like I said, people have expressed interest to have these resources in other area. And because the infrastructure is open, if you are interested, please contact me and then we can discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. Any questions for Susanna on the cookbook? No, perfectly clear. And very good to see other communities want to pick it up as well.
Okay, so for our penultimate talk, I'd like to invite up Volker Meermans, who's going to speak to us about fair enabling practices in math mathematics. Here we go. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's a great pleasure to be here, and this is really a call for help in two directions. The one direction is a technical direction. We've seen all the nice data management plans, and how to implement them for mathematics is an open problem. And the second thing is, we are a small community with a lot of knowledge, which is very old, some of it, and uh, we are not very much fitting to the big infrastructures that are in EOSC. And so the question is how we can get into this. So, in the past, mathematics has been not paying much attention to creation and sharing of data. It was mainly publications. There were some data sets like logarithm table, which some older of you may still know, or, <clears throat> or tables of geometric models. But today it's routine to create mathematical data sets in the gigabyte range, both human created, also machine created data. But there's a huge variety, and some of these are open and some of them are closed source examples. For example, databases for small groups um, or mathematical modeling libraries, which are used in engineering, or subroutine libraries for software. And uh, what are the fair principles in mathematics? So there's a wide agreement in the mathematical community that data sets should be a common resource and open and freely available. And this includes the software that produces the data. So that's great. However, the data are produced, published, and maintained with virtually no systematic attention and to the fair principles. In fact, often the sharing of data is an afterthought. Um, and for an overview of mathematical data sets, you, there are these publications. So one can really say that current mathematical data is largely unfair in, in this respect. So what is the problem? The problem is the strength of mathematics to abstractify objects or processes from many different areas with the same formalism. But it's the same time a weakness because then you don't know anymore where it comes from. And uh, when it comes to fair principle, because the data for fairness should be combined with a lot of semantics. For example, AX equals B is a linear system, but it could also be a partial differential equation, a data fitting procedure, or a statistical uh, approach. And currently, there is no good and systematic way to present formulas formal proofs, programs, and graphs and diagrams in such a way that you can find them and reuse them. And there is very many different data types that are used in the mathematical community, record data, array data, link data, knowledge graphs, metadata. metadata. And so we are really stuck, and we really need help in the direction of how to systematize that. Um, another problem with mathematical data is they're non-uniform, and they usually have structural information which is highly structured and hard to find and reuse uh, individually. So the representation and modeling of mathematical data it's much more difficult than one thinks. Everybody thinks math is a language of everything. You can write it down in math, you write down a formula. Hey, but if you see the formula and you don't know what it means, then you have no clue and you can't recover it. And there's no available standard for associated complex semantics to it or provenance data. And this imp effectively impedes most reuse in practice. And um, actually, often mathematical data sets are so large that determining the, the identifier or the sought-after object 
is much harder than recreating the whole data set, which also cannot be uh, the solution. So in the mass community, there are quite a lot of initiatives. So in Germany, there is a government-sponsored initiative called MADI. Some of the people are here in EOSC um, to try to make a step in this direction to achieve this. Essentially, the old data, there is an initiative to make all these freely available as a digital mass library. That doesn't mean it's findable, reusable, or anything. It exists. That's, that's uh, the thing. Uh, in the publishing, we go very much for open source uh, in an S2O, su uh, subscribe to open model. And then there is uh, mathematical databases like Centralblatt, which is a search database for mathematical uh, um, articles and software. That's open now. There's an encyclopedia. There's archive, which is well known in the uh, math and physics and other communities. Um, and there is uh, a lot of other initiatives in this direction, but none of them are really in the direction of the FAIR principles. And uh, what should be done for mass within EOC? We should be create semantics aware data structures. And we assure semantic interoperability. And I think what we need is so-called deep FAIR services that process individual entries and their individual structures. Uh, improve symbolic representation languages, knowledge graphs, semantic web, uh, and databases for concrete data, and data structures, data sharing structures like GitHub. And so to conclude, um, if I've listened to all this talk here, and in most of the talks I couldn't understand first what the person, I had to Google what the acronyms meant that people are using. Everybody's complaining about mass, that we are, we, are, we, are, we are using languages nobody understands, but it's the same here. And um, so open science is our goal, and, and mathematics has been worldwide and for millennia, and Europe is a key hub, and EOC should be a vehicle for unite, unifying also this part of science, and jargon minimization, and. Uh, Things like that should also come in. Thanks a lot. Any questions for Volker? No? Oh, yeah. Romain? I'm just curious because when it's a really easy science to make an ontology, it's something very horrible. So in mathematics, it will be. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, must be our goal, right? <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for this contribution. I, this is very close to my heart. <laughs> I, I, I wrote a lot of work on that. Um, there, there was an effort which started about 2003, 2004, maybe you remember or, or know about Mathematical Knowledge Management Conference Series. Um, and they did try to, to address exactly this. How do we create data sets which we can reuse? And there were a, lot of, uh, a couple of standards which were in the making, uh, OMDOC and MathML, MathXML, MathML, yeah. it comes from, from those years. Uh, what I see actually a problem for, for this data, um, the use cases are not very clear yet. Uh, I mean, you are formalizing uh, whatever data sets, but if you mainly in, in the MKM uh, community, they were actually trying to do proofs, automated proofs. And then you need to organize your data in such a way that you can, you can uh, actually do those proofs of proof verification. So um, do you think there is any chance that we, we, we define some very concrete use cases uh, to, to to help with this verification of mathematical data, data sets. And uh, where could we go to? Because otherwise, search engines for mathematical data, they are there. Um, the, um, 
handbook of, of um, mathematical function which you mentioned there that yeah. is also very good to search it's also very well organized but they have a very concrete use case yeah and so I, I think it can be done it needs a huge effort um, we have a we have in the background we have a, a, a pretty uni unified language already uh, in producing data like LaTeX but it, it is not used in a way. So the publishers take, take the LaTeX code and turn it into some crazy XML or HTML version, and then it's all gone. So we could, in principle, do that. And we need to convince the communities, the, in, the interoperability in physics and engineering and chemistry and all these other communities which produce mathematical formulas and they, they need to be able to be linked to the mathematical formulas that are used in the people that analyze or program or whatever do to it. Excellent, thank you very much, Volker. Okay, so final talk, last but not least, I'd like to invite up Zed Baukers from Fraunhofer, who's going to speak about fair data spaces. Thank you very much. Actually, I, I would like to start about um, or with um, the, the confusing abbreviation across disciplines because for three days, OS for me was operating system. And okay, what operating system is doing here? I mean, not in the, 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 the EOS world, but in so many presentation I saw OS and it is open science, but for me it was operating system and I realized today actually. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Zaid Bukhars. I'm from Fraunhofer Institute for Applied Information Technology. I'm going to introduce uh, Fair Data Spaces, Fair Data Spaces project, which is a common data space for industry, science, and society. And to show you the importance of data spaces, or fair data spaces, I would like to start with this dummy story about Leah, a young scientist, who uh, works on developing an AI-based defect decision detection system for medical 3D prints. And for this, she needs data, right? Uh, by all means, uh, Leah is searching or trying to find a provider of a high quality, quality medical 3D manufacturing data sets, and bam, everyone claims he has a high quality data set. So, uh, how to ensure or how to know who has the, high qu the highest quality data set? Actually, Chris was talking about this in, in, in his talk. That's one of, of the problems. And Leah thinks that Ben has a good quality data set and they decide to make a deal and to exchange data. So Ben transfers all this data as an attach attachment in email, I don't know, gigabytes, and uh, Leah pays, or the organization of Leah pays Ben for, for the data set because this is data set exchange and not data set sharing. But she was disappointed because she couldn't understand the data set. She couldn't understand the columns, the, the, the units, and the images. So that's one of the other problems. So the data set is not fair. It's not interoperable even among human beings, not, not, not machines. Other problems we have in this setting, in this uh, data exchange setting, is how we can make sure that Leah and Ben uh, are who they say they are, and also whether they play by the rules. So therefore, we need an infrastructural service to enable data provider and data consumer to first find each other, and second, to trust each other. And fortunately, in Europe, we have initiatives that can help us do this. Uh, the first is GaiaX. So GaiaX is a federated and secure data infrastructure for Europe and beyond with more than 350 members, mostly companies. So GaiaX can give us uh, the standards of sovereignty over data. And we have on the other side NFDI. So NFDI is the National Research Data Infrastructure for the German Science System. So it's, it's equivalent to EOSC, but on, on the German level. 
And NFDI can give us the standards of FAIR and open science. So here, FAIR data spaces comes into play in order to link industry to science. So FAIR data spaces is a German project funded by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research with a vision to have a common cloud-based data space for business, science, and society. Of course, based on the FAIR principles. The mission of FAIR data spaces is to create and expand energies between existing technologies, initiatives, so GAIA-X and NFDI, and also to, um, to overcome the boundaries between these two words, industry and science. So despite um, Fair Data Spaces is a German project, but the vision of the Fair Data Spaces is beyond Germany. So therefore, I'm standing here and giving this, this talk and uh, also discussing with, with all of you or most, most of, of you about your, your work. And that's why we are also involved in these initiatives and work closely with, with them, such as GAIA-X and, and, and EOSC. So in fair data spaces, we don't aim to create an infrastructure, a concrete infrastructure, for a reason you all know, because uh, of the sustainability. So when the project is over, then we cannot uh, ensure the sustainability of, uh, of the infrastructure. But we are working on concrete demonstrators from different domains. So we have uh, the biodiversity data space research data quality assurance, and the cross-platform data analytics about which I'm going to, to give you a brief overview. So um, when we have a centralized analytics on healthcare data, uh, we have, this suffers actually from many problems. So no GDPR compliant, loss of data sovereignty, and so on. So in order to solve this, we, we use in fair data spaces institutional incremental learning. I'm not going to talk about this part here, federated and parallel learning. So here, no, I missed, yeah. So what we do here, we, the data actually stays in its original location, and we have an analytic tool which visit this data in its original location, do the learning there, and then take the knowledge, go to the, the next location or data station, do, or do the learning in an incremental way, and aggregate the learning. So not aggregate the result, but the learning so that um, we don't extract knowledge from specific data set or from one data set. And with this solution, we are actually solving many problems. Uh, one of them is data control, the reusability of uh, healthcare data. Uh, which is very difficult in a centralized way. Uh, the, the, we have federated solution, interoperability, ethics, and so on. So actually, that's not all. Uh, we are also looking for other demonstrators, and that's why we, have the, we are going to launch the, the, the first open call to invite all st stakeholders who are interested in our, um, in our view, in our mission, to link industry to, to science, and we are going to, uh, to give funds for, for these projects. So uh, not necessarily from, or compared to the demonstrations I, I was talking about, but from any domain and discipline. So if you are interested, please don't hesitate to, to contact me. If you don't have time to work on the demonstrators, but you, you share our vision about linking industry to, to, to science, we would also be happy to, to collaborate with you, individuals and organizations, so feel free to contact me, my colleagues Daniela and, and Christoph. Um, so the project, these are the participants or the logos of the participants of the, the project. And thank you very much. And I think Excellent. I think I should get a prize for eight minutes. So <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> no, very good timing. Thank you very much, Ed. And question here from Barbara. Yes. So what you presented reminds me very much to uh, the concept of um, fair data visiting. So yeah, fair data visiting. Visiting. Yeah. Is it the same approach, right? So you are not really taking the original data. You are doing the data analysis 
where it is and you just take the results out of it to yeah, so actually, um, in in one of the working group at RDA uh, that I'm, I'm I'm part of, we we use visitation data visitation. Uh, I I believe you you yeah. mean the same thing. Uh, so actually, yes and no. So I cannot. It's the same principle, but I cannot ensure that the data visitations solve all the problems that I mentioned. So that's, that's the point, because in, in uh, institutional incremental learning, what we have is that the analytic tools doesn't provide or doesn't report the result after visiting one data station. Because with this, you, get, you are getting somehow uh, an implicit knowledge about the data. You don't have access to the data itself, but you have an implicit knowledge, right? So if, for example, how many female patients you have, right? The analytic tool can give you this. But in an institu institutional incremental learning, you visit all the data stations, you do this, you do the learning on all of them, such that, so you have, you have all the data at one station, and then you report the, the result of all the data sets to the central. So that's the main specification of uh, institutional incremental learning. I hope I answered your question. Excellent. Thank you very much, Zed. And um, just another thanks to all our speakers for keeping on time. We're only just over the hour. Um, I think the dinner is at seven tonight, so um, have a good journey into town and see you all there.